My name is Morgan Brown. I'm the owner of 10X Geoscience. Uh, this presentation was given at the Permian Basin Geophysical Society's annual exploration meeting in May of 2015. The title is Opening the Black Box of Anisotropic Seismic Processing. Nearly every branch of the physical sciences uh, has the word anisotropy somewhere. So in this talk, anisotropy refers to the anisotropy of seismic velocity. Specifically, uh, seismic waves travel at different speeds through a given volume of rock, depending on the propagation direction. While shear waves are uh, potentially useful and interesting, uh, in this talk I'm going to stick to P waves. When you look for seismic anisotropy in Wikipedia, you get this, which is a complex and pretty uh, mathematical explanation. So even if you master the mathematics, you may uh, end up lacking intuition on bigger picture questions like how does anisotropy manifest in real rocks, how does it affect seismic data, how do I process the seismic data, and most importantly, uh, will it change the seismic interpretation. So in the next few slides, I'll review several of the key interpretation pitfalls uh, that, of anisotropy. When you fail to account for anisotropy in seismic migration, the reflectors may be laterally mispositioned and the dips may be incorrect. If you fail to account for anisotropy in pre-stack dip migration, or PSDM, the seismic events may not tie the well tops. On this, on this isotropic PSDM image, the seismic events are roughly 3% too deep, or 250 foot mist ties at uh, 8,000 feet depth. Migrated offsets or angle, or angle gathers are used for a variety of applications. So seismic processors use them for velocity analysis and fracture analysis. Interpreters use them for AVO and inversion. And we all assume that after processing, they're perfectly flat. Yet if you fail to count for anisotropy, they can exhibit uh, hockey sticks, which make them impossible to flatten. So for all these applications, this adds uh, uh, risk to the uh, interpretation or analysis. Speaking of AVO, what happens if you convert a migrated offset gather to incidence angle without correctly accounting for the anisotropy? In this case, we assumed a simple and fairly mild anisotropy and found that there was a 14% error in the offset to angle computation at 50 degrees. This could risk screwing up the uh, ABO gradient calculation. So anisotropy has several known causes. Uh, the first is due to rock fabric. So shale or shaley rocks are composed of uh, platy grains of rock, while sandstone grains, for instance, have a more random orientation. So shales are stiffer along the bedding plane, meaning that horizontal velocity is faster than vertical velocity. And this effect is far less pronounced with sandstones. Similarly, you can get anisotropy in a stack of isotropic rocks. Imagine that you have uh, layers of wood with a couple thin layers of, of interbedded sponge. So when you squeeze the stack vertically, it's uh, squishy. However, when you squeeze the, sca the stack horizontally, it's uh, basically as stiff as the wood. So again, velocity will be faster horizontally than it will be vertically. If you turn the wood sponge stack on its side, uh, simulating open fractures, you also get an anisotropy. So here the waves travel faster along the fracture plane than they do uh, normal to it. So the first two types of anisotropy are called uh, vertical or bedding plane oriented anisotropy while the latter is called horizontal or azimuthal anisotropy. So we'll go through a simple seismic imaging experiment to highlight what we've just learned. So imagine that we fire a source in an isotropic constant velocity rock. The propagating wave front is semicircular. So bedding plane anisotropy, when the layers are flat, is called VTI, or vertically transverse isotropy. The simplest type of VTI anisotropy is elliptical, so in a given amount of time, the orange wavefront travels further horizontally than the isotropic wavefront. Vertically, it travels the same distance. Elliptical VTI is nice because it only requires a single Thompson parameter to describe the stretch of the wavefront. So unfortunately, the most common type of VTI rocks are not elliptical, but they actually they require a second Thompson parameter to describe the wavefront. 
This is called analytic VTI because the wavefront is no longer an ellipse. So notice how the gray analytic uh, wavefront is stretched even more than the orange or the blue wavefront horizontally, but it still uh, uh, travels the same distance vertically. So what if the bedding plane is tilted? Then you have tilted transverse isotropy, or, or TTI. So the wavefront is the same as it is in analytic VTI, except for the fact that it's rotated so that it kind of bulges in the direction of the bedding plane. So the physics behind TTI is solid, um, but we have a problem. We now have four parameters to describe this TTI and isotropy rather than, than two. So with real data, that can, be, that can be an issue. So in this slide, we illustrate HTI, or horizontal transverse isotropy. Now we're looking at the wavefront in map view. And blue is isotropic, and it's a circle, whereas yellow is HTI. So notice how the HTI wavefront bulges along the orientation of the fractures, or in this direction. A couple qualifiers about HTI. So first, the effect is typically five to ten times weaker than uh, the VTI effect for P waves. And secondly, when we, ass we assume a, sim a single set of vertical fractures with a consistent orientation, when the fractures are tilted, or if we have multiple open fracture sets, the physics becomes uh, pretty complicated to describe, perhaps intractably so. Now I'm going to show a simple zero offset seismic experiment that highlights these anisotropy concepts. So we send energy from the surface to a buried target, and then measure the echo time with a geophone at the surface. We call the recorded echo signal a seismic trace. Notice how the actual reflection point is shifted to the uh, to the left of the surface location of the uh, source in the geophone. So when we repeat the experiment from many surface locations, we obtain a seismic reflection for each segment of the target. Notice how the apparent location of the target from the seismic data is wrong. So migration is an automated procedure to correctly position events which are mispositioned due to geologic dip. The concept behind migration is actually quite simple. Uh, we don't know where the energy was reflected from, but we do know the echo time. So all we can say is that the reflection occurred somewhere along a semicircle uh, according to that reflection time. So we basically, migration basically digitally sprays energy out uh, in a digital image along this, this semicircular trajectory. So if we repeat the process for many adjacent traces, we get a plot like this. So I made the, uh, the lines partially transparent so that when they overlay one another, the color saturation grows. And you can see that uh, where I draw this dotted line, this is where a geophysicist would probably inter interpret the true target location. So let's continue the process for all the traces and make a map of each different reflector. Now, if we compare the, the target locations, so the known target locations, uh, to the ones that were interpreted off the migration images, notice how we get a perfect match. So it's kind of a magical uh, process migration. Uh, all, this, all it assumes is that we know the velocity, which is a, which is a big if, but uh, nonetheless, it's done very uh, commonly. So the reason I went through this uh, simple experiment was to show how anisotropy affects the migration image. So in this case, what we'll do is model the seismic data assuming an isotropy, and then migrate the data assuming isotropy. So the red lines here are the anisotropic migrated events. So in this slide, we've assumed elliptical VTI, and uh, this causes some mispositioning of the steeply dipping events and some fairly mild dip errors, around 4 or 5% of degrees. As we move from elliptical VTI to analytic VTI, notice how the, the uh, lateral shifts and the dip errors uh, increase considerably. When we move further to TTI, with the bedding plane uh, oriented like, like here, uh, even the flat reflectors are in the wrong place and the, and the uh, dip errors and positioning errors have become quite significant. So geologically, this is uh, somewhat analogous to what we might see at a salt flank, where we've got uh, nearly vertical beds with uh, uh, discordant dips truncating against them. 
So it's really no surprise that uh, people have noticed that salt flanks are very, very sensitive to uh, anisotropy, particularly when they're near vertical like this. So interestingly, when the TTI bedding plane is flipped so that it's more consistent with the, the dips shown here, notice that the uh, anisotropy effects are actually less severe than they are for elliptical VTI, which is interesting. But even more interesting, the uh, flat reflector is actually still not in the right place. So even though the effect looks mild, it, it could have the risk of changing the interpretation. So this is an interest, interesting example from um, uh, the front range of Colorado, um, just south of the city of Boulder, which is near Denver. Um, so the layer mitorogeny caused compressional tectonics, and what's happened is that we have about 8,000 feet of overburden that's been tilted up at almost a perfect 41 degree angle. And uh, those tilted beds overlie a uh, uh, shallow thrust fault and with uh, nearly flat beds below it. So I didn't have sufficient well data to really uh, accurately pin down the TTI parameters, so I used something fairly simple. But if you notice here, that the TTI image simply looks better uh, uh, everywhere than the isotropic image. If you look at the, compare the green arrow and the TTI image to the red arrow on the isotropic, notice how the, uh, you know, the beds truncating against the thrust fault are much better imaged with TTI. All the steep dips are imaged better with TTI. And this little uh, splay off the main thrust is, is far better imaged on, on the TTI. So even a, a simple and, and almost seemingly trivial choice of TTI parameters, in this case at least, almost a textbook example, led to some really nice uh, improvements in interpretability of the geology. So when we have anisotropy, the velocity that uh, best focuses the seismic data, V focusing, is typically higher than the vertical velocity, which is V vertical. So V vertical would come from a check shot, for instance. So as a result, when we run uh, PSDM with V focusing, the events are too deep. So interestingly, uh, the depth miss tie is um, almost exclusively controlled by just one of the Thompson parameters, delta, and we're going to come back to this later. So time processing can absolutely cause what I call false anisotropy. Now, static shifts uh, mimic the effect of a Thompson delta. So here is two, time, uh, two versions of the same survey processed by two different uh, time processors. And when you look at the colored lines on the two, uh, the two images, notice how uh, the surveys have a shift of about 40 to 60 milliseconds uh, between them, which is caused by differences in how the refraction statics were computed and applied. And which one is right, we, we may never know, since, uh, since we, you can't really monkey with time is time, and when you start monkeying with it, you uh, um, are just hoping for the best. So, you know, while the rocks that, that under on the subsurface may exhibit uh, what I call an, an Earth delta, the effective delta that uh, we depth processors use is very much affected by the time processing. So depth imagers estimate a volume of, of Thompson delta parameter from PSDM depth miss ties. So when we run a depth migration with the Thompson delta, the image then ties the wells. So what if we did a sloppy job of estimating V focusing? So notice how the PSDM has some, some wild structures, and then look at this uh, uh, histogram of mist tie for the three different wells here. So they're very they're all over the place. Uh, the Thompson Delta model that implied by those mist ties is thus pretty wild. So you can you can correct a wild looking image to something that's simple and ties the wells if you bring a wild looking Thompson Delta in, but uh, here we show an isotropic PSDN that's been computed with a more sensible velocity. So the structures are simplified and the mist ties are pretty consistent from well to well. So if you do an anisotropic PSDN project, you should expect the mist tie distribution to be consistent. Uh, Scott McKay nicely describes this issue in his depth imaging for interpreters talk. So what, why do we care about this? Uh, if the imaging velocity is sloppy, then we require a crazy delta to tie the wells. And then what happens if we go a long distance from the well? So in short, you can't trust the dips at all away from the wells if you have, if you have a, a crazy Thompson Delta volume. 
So uh, as my advice to to uh, customers of, of depth processors is to always QC the anisotropy parameters. You want to you want to peer into the black box and um, ensure that they've come up with a simple Thompson Delta model and they're not uh, fudging the results. So before we discuss how anisotropy causes uh, the so-called hockey stick problem, I need to explain how migrated gathers are computed and how they're affected by velocity. So imagine a simple two-tray seismic experiment. So if we depth convert each trace with the correct velocity and arrange them adjacently with increasing offset, we get something like this. So notice how the events from the two different experiments are at the same depth. What happens with it when the depth conversion velocity is wrong? So certainly the depth will be wrong on both traces. However, the long offset has a, has a longer ray path, so it accumulates uh, a larger velocity error and a larger depth error along that longer ray path. So when we migrate the entire data set with the wrong velocity and arrange it into gathers, the events will seem to curve up or down. So in fact, we use this fact to basically um, update the migration velocity. So we measure the curvature, relate it to a change in velocity, update the velocity, migrate, and then repeat the process. So here's a set of PSDM angle gathers. So the left panel is an inline, the center panel is a cross line, and the right panel is the angle gather at the inline cross line intersection. So the data were migrated with a suboptimal velocity and we see some residual curvature on the angle gather. So after eight isotropic velocity updates, notice how the focusing velocity has improved greatly and the events on the angle gather seem to flatten out. So I'll go back and forth a few times. It's before, after, before, after. Um, but if you zoom in to the top Niobera reflection, we have a bit of a problem. So notice how, when we look closely, the near angles seem to be curving down, implying that the velocity should be slower, while the far angles are curving up, implying that we should speed up the velocity. So which is it? Uh, as it turns out, the near angles are affected by Thompson delta only, while the far angles are also affected by Thompson epsilon, and epsilon is usually more significant than delta. So because we didn't specify Thompson, the correct Thompson parameters in the migration, we could not flatten this gather. So you need anisotropic migration to systematically flatten this gathers. So this is the only mass slide in the talk. Uh, the equation here is uh, Ilya Zvonkin's equation for velocity as a function of angle in an anal analytic BTI medium. So notice how there are two Thompson parameters, delta and epsilon. Now if we rearrange the equation and, and apply some simple uh, trig relations, uh, we're basically left with this. Um, so if we, have to if we define an analyticity anal parameter, which is epsilon minus delta over 1 plus 2 delta, then we see that essentially you, you can come to a result where you approximately have the vertical velocity times um, delta times sine squared plus eta times sine to the fourth. So in this graph we plot elliptical versus analytic velocity versus angle. And notice that from 0 to 25 degrees, that the analytic curve and the elliptical curve are almost uh, overlaying one another. So what this means is, uh, out to 25 degrees, that fourth order, um, sine to the fourth term, barely has any effect. This is a pretty key insight because it implies that as long as we analyze data from 0 to 25 degrees for velocity, the velocity is really only contaminated by delta. Beyond 25 degrees, and the data is contaminated by delta and epsilon. It's worth pointing out that in real rocks, uh, eta is almost always greater than zero, meaning that uh, epsilon is almost always greater than delta. There's a lot of current interest in using near surface velocity models, usually from refraction tomography, to seed a shallow PSDM velocity, but there's a problem with this. Uh, head waves used for refraction tomography travel horizontally for the most part. So they travel at a velocity of v vertical times the square root of 1 plus epsilon. Whereas the NMO velocity that we measure from reflections is v vertical times the square root of 1 plus, plus 2 delta. So both refraction velocities and reflection velocities are affected by anisotropy, but, they're, but in, in an inconsistent, uh, inconsistent way.
So it's valid if we want to merge near surface and interval velocities, but in my opinion, this should be done well into the anisotropic PSDM workflow and not at the beginning, which is kind of where a lot of, uh, a lot of people recommend that you, you might do it. Okay, so the last several slides have been leading uh, to, to this point, which is a right way to do VTI PSDM. Notice that I don't say the right way, as there is uh, some potential variations on this workflow. However, what I describe here is what I consider a, a robust workflow that's very appropriate and, and uh, borne out through experience for onshore data. So onshore, we have lower data quality, and shorter offsets usually than offshore, but we have more well control. So for our first isotropic velocity updates, we should estimate a velocity that flattens the gathers uh, to no more than 30 degrees. So if we don't mute the data, then notice how we have apparent hockey sticks. So the gathers are flat out to 30 degrees, but they start hockey sticking up when they go out to 50 degrees. So the next step is to estimate Thompson delta from, the, from uh, uh, depth mist ties. You see here this purple, this purple well top. And there's the corresponding seismic event. And then also estimate uh, the eta, eta function from uh, doing hockey stick analysis. You can migrate with different choices of eta that basically best flatten the, flatten the hockey sticks. And finally, update the uh, vertical velocity. So after you've done all that, um, what, you're, what you're left with is a, is a competent VTI Earth model. And uh, notice how, A, we've rectified the mist eyes. So this purple, this purple well top lines up with the seismic event. And also notice how the hockey sticks are pretty darn flat out to 50 degrees, and even some events here that aren't well focused on the isotropic because there's so much curvature are actually flattened pretty nicely on, on the VTI. So here's, a, here's the, the, what happens when you do VTI in a wrong way. So specifically, if we basically fail to mute the isotropic gathers to 30 degrees, then the velocity that we estimate tries to flatten all the angles, as we saw before. So the apparent eta is smaller because there's, there's, it takes some of the hockey stick, but the apparent delta is larger. So in essence, if you do this incorrectly, you steal from eta and give it to delta. And, you know, and why is that a big deal? It's, it's a big deal because you'll never get the events as flat as you could if you do the recommended workflow. And this, this problem is going to be, this is going to become a really big problem when the dips start to, start to steepen up. So I've explained anisotropy to many G and G people, and it, it's common for people to confuse uh, VTI with HTI. So as we move into HTI, I want to I want to rehash this. Uh, VTI causes depth mist ties on PSDM images, and it also causes hockey sticks. By contrast, HTI is an azimuthal effect, so we need to sort the data by azimuth to see the effect manifested. If we if we do that, then we'll see an, sort of an idealized sinusoid if, if we group the data. For a, for a fixed uh, angle or offset versus azimuth. So based on the amplitude and, orient and, and, and phase of this uh, sinusoid, we can infer things like fracture orientation, fracture magnitude, or more generally, uh, you know, stress orientation, stress magnitude. So before we get to the, uh, the pretty pictures of fracture attributes, I have to throw some cold water on you and, and ask, uh, ask ourselves what does this HTI stuff really mean so we'll do some forward modeling so we basically have a three layer HTI model here and we're going to perform uh, azimuthal ray tracing so I assume a constant background velocity of 12,000 feet per second and vary the HTI parameters in each layer so we're going to shoot a single ray at 45 degrees up to the surface and we're going to add, analyze the azimuthal differences in travel time of each of those ray traced arrivals so in the first experiment, we basically have uh, assume that we have no fracturing in the top two layers and a 5% HTI effect in the third layer, oriented in an azimuth of 45 degrees. So 5% is a pretty significant amount of HTI for P waves, and it's possibly uh, too strong. But uh, nonetheless, this, this Earth model produces a 4 millisecond HTI sinusoid which is measurable, yes, but uh, kind of disappointingly weak. We have a thousand, you know, essentially a thousand foot thick layer of fractures with 5% fracturing, and we only see a four millisecond response. 
So here's a different, a different test, which I call the detectability threshold test, where we basically have a small HTI delta of 0.5% uh, over all the layers with the same orientation from top to bottom. And you can see that the HTI sinusoid is, is, has an amplitude of only 3 milliseconds, which is really just on the threshold of detectability uh, for all but the, the best quality data. So, however, 0.5% uh, HTI effect is probably a pretty realistic magnitude in most rocks. So, in case you haven't gotten this yet, uh, this HTI effect is going to be subtle even under the best of conditions. So, I frequently get questions to the effect of what happens when two layers have a canceling HTI effect. So here in the bottom two layers, I put the same HTI magnitude, but I put orientations that were 90 degrees out of phase, so designed to cancel each other out. And sure enough, the HTI effect does nearly cancel out, but it's interesting. Notice that, that there is a non-zero shift from NMO time of about, of about 4 milliseconds. So if you had a localized, if this effect was spatially localized, it would manifest itself as, as a pull-up rather than azimuthal effect. So all azimuths would be affected in kind of a similar way. Also, kind of distressing. So the last experiment is, is perhaps the most devious. So here I put a weak 1% response in the top layer, oriented at 90 degrees. In the bottom two layers, I put a 3% response with an orientation of 45 degrees. And the aggregate response at the base of the third layer is, is pretty strong. So we have about an 8 millisecond uh, amplitude on the sinusoid. However, notice that the the peak of that sinusoid, which is how we infer fracture orientation, is happening at 65 degrees. And there were no rocks in this model at 65 degree orientation. We have some rocks at 45 and we have some rocks at 90. So uh, we're, getting, we're getting a sinusoidal response, but it's misleading us. It's, it's actually giving us the wrong orientation. So here's a typical HTI uh, attribute map. Hot colors imply a large response, cool colors imply a weak response. So unfortunately here it looks good but the largest measurable effect is only in the 0.3% range which is uh, what I told you from that detectability threshold test. Um, a 3% HTI effect is not going to produce um, uh, a very a measurable effect. So I, I would argue that 0.3% is really about in the noise. So, uh, in short, when it comes to using HTI attributes for drilling decisions, all I have to say is buyer beware, um, particularly in the more simplistic, uh, typical unconventional geologies. I, I will say that in my experience that uh, HTI analysis is pretty robust in areas that have a uh, significant tectonic footprint and a fairly regular regional stress regime. And one such place would be like the uh, Paradox Basin in Utah. Uh, a lot of tectonics, pretty consistent regional stress, and we see HTI effects in, in many places from top to bottom, and they do correlate with uh, um, productive wells. But this is, this is uh, not, not the norm where most people are drilling. So wrapping up, uh, I really intended the audience to get three big picture benefits in this talk. Number one, an understanding of the basic conceptual model of anisotropy. Number two, a sense of how anisotropy affects the real data. And number three, um, how anisotropic processing should be done, particularly when it comes time to choose a vendor to do either BTI, PSDM, or, or indoor fracture analysis. So in acknowledging people who made this possible, I'd like to really thank uh, Fidelity EMP, one of, one of my really uh, dear clients from over the years for releasing the, the bulk of the data examples which I've shown in this talk. Uh, most of the data examples were generated when I was uh, uh, running wave imaging technology, so I have to acknowledge them as well. And finally, I need to thank uh, Randy Ray, Ned Stern, and Jim Applegate, who uh, in, in different ways made the uh, Rocky Flats data example available uh, to, to be shown here. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, please uh, give us a call, give us an email um, if you have any questions about this. Again, my name is Morgan Brown, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your feedback and uh, hopefully doing some work for you, whether it's consulting or uh, site processing. Thank you.